All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all uh, virtually, though it may be. Uh, I am really excited uh, about this program that is hosted uh, by UUP's statewide Sexual Orientations United for Liberty or Soul Committee. Uh, we have a, a great program planned for today, and uh, it really is just an honor and a privilege to be with, you, be with you all. My name is Fred Kowal. I'm the president of United University Professions. And again, um, thank you all for taking the time to be here. And in fact, today we're going to hear from our colleagues from across the state about the harmful don't say gay bills that have been proposed in states across this country and the impact that they will have on youth in these communities, and indeed on all segments of our society. Because I think that we all must realize, given the events of the past few weeks, that our democracy is in danger. You know, you could really go back till 2016, but definitely we were reminded last Friday morning when the Supreme Court stripped childbearing people of the essential right to make choices about their own bodies. And within that decision and the opinion of the Supreme Court, Justice Clarence Thomas, he went there. He called on the court to reconsider key privacy and equal rights cases, including the rights to contraception, to same-sex marriage. And though he didn't say it, it would be included, interracial marriage. We are talking about personal rights that were hard, hard fought for and some just newly won. We as educators and healers, we must be ready. In fact, we are summoned to teach inclusion and equity in our classrooms and in our offices, but also in our communities. I believe firmly that we're called upon as educators and healers to be, to be prophetic voices, to call out the hatred that we see and the exclusion that we see, call it out and fight to end it. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As workers, as union members, we live by this principle day after day. You know, a, a harm to one is a harm to all, as we say. And I think that's, you know, I guess it's, it's most appropriate as Pride Month comes to a close, our work is clearly far from complete. The rights of LGBTQ plus communities are under attack from the don't say gay bills that I referenced to bills banning transgender kids from playing sports. There are so many instances where there are dis dangerous and discriminatory, discriminatory proposals that are being proposed in so many states that are built on hate and hate cannot and will not be tolerated by this union. And, and in these days, I, I find myself again looking to something else that, that Martin Luther King Jr. often talked about. And, and that was the reference he made to the moral arc of the universe and how it bends towards justice slowly. Well, sometimes, sometimes it bends back thanks to the ignorant and the hateful among us. That must not cause us to surrender or to lose hope. It must serve to summon us to fight harder and to live our principles with a commitment that overcomes their hate. I'm looking forward to learning from our experts today, our panelists, and working with all of us together to develop strategies to push for the progressive change we need now more than ever and to protect the rights we want. So I want to thank you again for joining us today. I encourage you to stay connected with our union in this important work and stay tuned because this is just the start. There's work to be done and we must get to it. I now have the great pleasure of introducing to all of us the UUP Soul Committee Chair, a member of the statewide executive board and the chapter president at Delhi and a good and dear friend and union sibling, Kelly Keck. Kelly. Thank you, Fred. And I would like to thank you all for joining uh, today the, the panel, uh, the UUP Pride Words Matter, Matter uh, panel, the erasure of uh, LGBTQ plus lives. 
The purpose uh, of this panel today is to discuss uh, the impacts that uh, the Don't Say Gay Bills have on both student learning as well as teacher working conditions. Um, and in light of the recent uh, uh, Supreme Court decisions, I would like to hopefully expand now the scope of the panel to discussion to include the uh, latest attacks on our collective rights, um, basically made by various fascist elements of our society. <clears throat> uh, the overall goal of the specific don't say gay bills are, is basically to restrict uh, the expression of gender identity uh, in schools and also to provide punishments for those who defy these uh, draconian bills. <clears throat> also, you'll have to excuse me, I am unfortunately uh, recovering from COVID. So that's why my voice is a little off today. <clears throat> But to start us out, uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, some of the states that have been or who are planning some version of the Don't Say Gay Bills. It's a fairly uh, lengthy list and it's not probably inclusive of all of them, uh, but we have definitely included on the list Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Iowa, Louisiana, Missouri, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Ohio, South Carolina, Indiana, Kentucky, and Texas. Uh, as a native born Ohio, Ohioan and someone who has, uh, who graduated from high school and um, got my graduate degree from the University of Kentucky, it is quite upsetting for me to know that my home states are um, working specifically against my rights. So that is uh, a personal affront, if you will. Um, of course, as mentioned, if you were to cross reference some of these states with those states which have banned or are planning to ban abortion or limit uh, access to abortion, the same names will most likely be present. If you're looking at the names of those states that have been limiting voter rights, it's going to be a similar list of names, uh, trans rights, uh, expands, expanding or protecting gun uh, rights as opposed to the rights of uh, us to live our lives without fear of um, gun violence. Uh, basically, what we're seeing is a comprehensive attack on all of our rights, which basically demands a comprehensive response uh, to these infringements. And this is what I'm hoping this panel discussion will be a first step to. So now I would like to introduce our panelists. Uh, the first will be Jess Blake. Uh, Jess Blake will be the moderator for the discussion. Jess is an EOP counselor at SUNY Delhi, uh, one of my close friends, and is the co-chair of the SUNY Delhi faculty and staff of Color Association. Uh, next would be Maddie Serio, is a licensed social worker at Upstate Medical University. Then we will also have Luca Jurich, is a, who is a LGBTQ uh, patient services coordinator at Upstate Medical. I would like to thank Upstate Medical for their involvement in this panel discussion. Thank you very much. I would also like to uh, introduce Sean Massey, Sean Massey is an associate professor of women, gender, and stu uh, sexuality studies at Binghamton University, and as Fred mentioned, was a former Binghamton chapter president. Thank you, Sean, for joining us. And then I would like to uh, introduce London Wright, uh, our non-SUNY uh, panel uh, participant. So uh, London is a staff, a staff therapist and outreach coordinator at Lemoyne College uh, located in Syracuse. So uh, again, thank you to our panelists. Um, but uh, prior to moving on, I just wanted to uh, say in case the ending, uh, the end of the panel comes quickly, at the end of the panel discussion, I'm hoping to have an opportunity um, to repeat, but I would like to ask everyone part participating in this call today to uh, continue or to expand your participation. Uh, in your local chapter activities uh, surrounding these issues. I would also like uh, to ask you to consider joining one of the following statewide UUP committees. Obviously the Soul Committee is one of them. Uh, also the Black and Latino Faculty and Staff Concerns Committee, 
uh, the Disability Right and Concerns Committee, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, and uh, the Women's Rights and Concerns Committee. All of these committees within UUP will be uh, hopefully working towards a, um, oh, my video went out, sorry about that. Uh, we'll be working towards a comprehensive approach to deal with these issues. So, um, so now I would uh, welcome you to uh, help me thank our panelists uh, in, this, uh, to, in, in their participation at this uh, panel. And now I will gladly hand it over to Jess Blake uh, as the moderator for the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our event today on the last day of Pride Month. So we want to be as proud as we possibly can. And we welcome everyone, allies as well, not just members of the LGBTQ plus I community. Um, so as Kelly mentioned, I am an EOP counselor at SUNY Delhi, and um, I'm also a co-chair for the uh, Staff of Color organization here at SUNY Delhi. I, my pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I would like us to begin a very interesting free-flowing conversation, respectful of everyone attending, of course, but I want, I, I don't believe we can be impactful if we don't allow our participants an opportunity to speak freely about how they really feel about these issues. So first thing, I wanna start off with a question. You can virtually raise your hand. Honestly, how familiar are most of our participants with the issues that are going on now regarding the don't say gay bills? How familiar are you with what's going on or progressing or not progressing? Raise hand, familiar, okay. Can anyone give me or speak and tell me a specific instance of a, maybe from a, a state that they're aware of a, a specific policy that is currently being enacted or being pushed? Does any, is anyone aware of anything specific that's going on in maybe Florida, Alabama, or any place like that? You can type it or you can speak it, it's okay. And we can also pick uh, someone. So Allison has their hand up, her hand up. Okay. Allison, would you mind sharing with Hi. us? Hi. Yes. Hi, how are you? Great, how about yourself? Yeah, can you just phrase the question again in terms of what you'd like me to share? Sure, so just in terms of your personal knowledge of maybe specific bills that are attempting to be enacted or have already been enacted in terms of LGBT people, in yeah, terms of I, restricting their rights. Right, I think what, I'm, what I've read the most about um, would be things in Florida and I have some uh, family members who live there and so they've shared a little bit about, um, you know, don't say gay and, and all those kinds of things. And so I've been trying to read, but I, I it, it's, there's so much going on that I'm finding it, it's so hard to, to keep up with everything, you know, in terms of how quickly things seem to be changing and, and these bills getting put forth. So I'm, I'm just eager to learn more about, about this. Well, I see in the chat, Beth from Buffalo mentioned that Texas is a, uh, uh, people who are taking care of trans, transgender children are being labeled as uh, child abusers. I have heard of that recently. Um, I I think the, I think what is going on, a, a tip of what's going on, is to get us to collectively, again, change how we view LGBT people. So viewing them as almost borderline abusers predators to children. I've also seen an article recently about an educator, I forgot. He was a like an elementary school teacher, loved in his community. But now because the state is enacting these bills, he's being accused of recruiting children into being LGBT. And so it's like we're attempting to go back to that predatory language in terms of the way we're describing the LGBT community. And, and that is dangerous, regardless of what state that's happening in our community. That's a dangerous attempt. And I think collectively, we need to be aware of it and we need to try to limit these efforts. So um, does anyone else? Okay. Um, 
Jay Blacksom from Blacksom from Alfred State said that transgender restrictions limiting children's ab ability to live their true their truth across the country. And I agree with that. It's also my personal opinion. What's happening is that we've advanced so much as a collective community in terms of young people. And when I say young, I mean kids under 10 years old are now self-identifying as, as transgender, non-binary, things of that nature. And I feel that this is scaring a lot of politicians and a lot of people who don't agree with that and don't acknowledge that gender is not a fixed identity and so that it can be on a spectrum. And so it's like these policies and these um, ideas, these ideas are turning into policies that are directly having negative effects on a lot of people, especially young people. And so a thing that we've also discussed amongst ourselves as a group is that these state policies will, if we allow them to, they will expand and could become dangerous and expand and become once again, federal issues. So we kind of want to have a panel discussion today um, discussing some of the specific dangers that these policies will have on the LGBTQ plus I community. And so I believe we're going to have Luca. Are you, Luca, my friend, are you prepared to start your, your panel discussion? I am, yes. Perfect. I turn it over to Luca. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess, for the introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Luca. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I work, um, as Kelly said already, I work at uh, SUNY Upstate with Inclusive Health Services as the LGBTQ Patient Services Coordinator. Um, however, my background is mostly in youth advocacy. And so since we're talking about the Don't Say Gay Bills and we're talking about um, kind of the effects that that is, that we could um, expect that to have on LGBTQ youth, um, I'll be providing just some like statistics and information about what we know already in regards to um, kind of normative child development around gender identity and then current experiences of LGBTQ youth um, in regards to kind of life stressors um, and the difference that support can make. So um, I first wanna just kind of discuss the um, APA resolution of 2020. So this is the American Psychological Association. Um, in 2020, they released a resolution that essentially said um, the, the thesis of the resolution um, was that diverse gender expressions and presentations, regardless of gender identity, and diverse gender identities beyond a binary classification are normal and positive variations of the human experience. So um, again, this is the American Psychological Association group that has done all of the research on human development, why brains are the way they are, all of that good work. Um, and the kind of basis of this resolution had to do with a few different things, but primarily we were, they were looking at um, kind of the recognition of sexual and gender diversity in young people, that this is something that develops in really early childhood and that therapeutic interventions of support, um, both medical and then social um, are complete game changers in that uh, child's ability to thrive, um, to accept themselves and to accept others. So, uh, we're looking at sexual and gender diversity in young folks, um, looking also at the consequences of stigma and minority stress, which um, my coworker Maddie will talk about a little bit more, but basically seeing that for young LGBTQ folks, um, there's higher rates of anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, all because of um, minority stress, so kind of undue stress placed on uh, minority groups, in this case, we're looking at queer folks. Um, because of the extra work that they have to do in the world in order to survive. Um, and then also higher risk for STIs and STDs due to inadequate sexual education. Um, and then finally, uh, the other kind of factor in this resolution of supporting um, gender queer and just queer youth in general um, was looking at school stressors. So identifying that gender and sexually um, diverse students uh, report increased connectedness and school safety when school personnel intervene and show up for them. Um, so kids in schools are already experiencing higher level, levels of bullying. Um, uh, some statistics say that 
one in eight um, youth who are like very young will not conform to traditional gender role, roles if given room to kind of explore the way that they're expressing their identities. Um, and that because of this, those kids also have reported um, wanting to miss school, uh, not feeling safe going to school and higher levels of bullying. So then the inverse of what we're seeing with that or the way to kind of mitigate and offer solutions is um, looking at what students have self-reported as supportive um, behavior. So again, kind of saying that um, there's an increase in connectedness, school safety, and the ability to just participate in education, um, social and peer support, things like that, when teachers choose to step up and intervene. Um, of course, if we're looking at the don't say gay bills, that's saying directly that teachers are no longer allowed to do this. And instead of being able to be allies to offer that safety, support, literally just giving kids the ability to be at school, um, they are then creating further barriers, uh, further separation from their ability to be healthy people um, that are not only exploring their identities in ways that are normal and good, um, but also able to navigate like basic um, health and self-care solutions that their um, cisgender heterosexual peers would be able to generally have pretty easy access to, or at least easier access to. So that's kind of the psychological um, framework that we would be coming from when talking about kind of youth development um, or like gender identity development in youth. And just the fact that this is something that is like normal, healthy and okay, and that kids already are in a place where they actively need adult and peer support in order to be able to um, engage in kind of, again, this like normal, healthy, okay part of themselves. I'm gonna go ahead and drop in the link, um, the link to the um, APA resolution so folks can look at that independently if they would like to. Um, that has like more information and statistics, which is great. So when we're looking from the school basis, then we're also pairing alongside um, family dynamics and kind of, you know, we have kids at school. Um, that's one space in which we can identify acceptance or rejection. And then of course, kids are going home to families or some kind of like um, family structure. Uh, the Family Acceptance Project has done a lot of work around identifying um, specific outcomes that are correlated to youth, um, LGBTQ youth who are in uh, one of three kinds of homes. So a home that is, um, excuse me, uh, rejecting, a home that's moderately rejecting, or a home that is accepting. Um, so a home that's moderately rejecting is uh, the kid comes out, um, or even before it comes out, like other folks are seeing that maybe there's some like um, gender non-conforming behaviors or uh, sexual curiosity, things like that. Um, moderately rejecting, uh, that would look like kind of overall rejecting behaviors with maybe some moments of acceptance. Acceptance, of course, means that they're actively embracing their child's identity. Highly rejecting means um, that they're actively rejecting the child's identity without a lot of um, variation in that response. So um, with the research the Family Acceptance Project has done, um, folks who are experiencing high rejection at a young age, um, we see that that creates a higher risk for health and mental health problems as they get older. So we're seeing that the basis, um, the base uh, responses that youth experience as they're exploring their identities at young ages have really significant impacts for how they're going to be able to be people in the world in the future. So um, kind of the difficult statistics to sit with are um, about eight times uh, LGBTQ youth who experience a low um, or a high level of rejection in their home are eight times more likely to attempt suicide um, than folks who um, experience like higher acceptance. Um, something that's interesting about this is that we have moderate rejection. So small moments of trying and making efforts significantly reduce that number um, to where it's two times more likely. Um, so there's still that possibility and um, factor of harm that is done, um, but it is reduced uh, with some small efforts, even in an imperfect household. Um, definitely agree, it is heartbreaking. Um, looking at the chat here, it is like absolutely devastating 
And also um, a thing that we are learning and that we're identifying is that um, as we are experiencing these points of rejection, um, so this will transfer over to kind of the next last point that I'm gonna make here, which is about homelessness, um, is that the ways in which we see um, you experience kind of these levels of stress is a very gradual over time series of moments of rejection that lead to um, the youth not being able to be safe in their home. So what that means is that there's a lot of opportunities for intervention. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to come alongside youth, um, come alongside queer kids and um, offer other versions of support. Like we saw the APA resolution um, with uh, kind of research around like school spaces, um, the presence of one safe adult can make a huge difference in a youth's life. So um, having an accepting family is really important. And also if that's not an option, there are other ways to intervene and offer support. Um, of course, that's the gravity of the don't take gay belts is that um, instead of those supports being more readily available, they are retracted. Um, and the kind of slow escalation that we would see, um, which would create opportunity for more moments of intervention is um, escalated even further, uh, moved along more quickly so that uh, the opportunity to kind of intervene and prevent some of these um, long-term mental health problems and then significant rates of homelessness uh, is more limited. So. That's kind of the general idea of what we're looking at right now as far as um, queer young folks and our understanding of um, where they're at with kind of normative behaviors around gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, questioning, things like that, what they need from the adults in their life to offer support, and then the ramifications, what happens when they don't have that support. Um, I'm also able to speak to kind of homelessness and kind of what, um, can inform that, but I also feel that I've been talking for quite a bit. So does anybody have questions? Um, I have links for all of kind of those different reference points. If well, um, Luca, Henry stuff. in the chat had a question. Henry, Henry from downstate um, f discussing Florida's education law and how it targets faculty and staff as well. And so if you are in an elementary school and you are addressing LGBT issues with students or LGBT parents, you could your job could be on the line. So that there's a direct correlation with um, employment, sustainability, being able to sustain yourself, and talking about LGBT issues. So Florida has definitely combined those two. So what do you what do you think about that, Luca? I mean, I think that's a really great question. Um, unfortunately, I'm not. Uh, position to be able to speak to um, the experiences of educators. Um, I can speak more to kind of experiences of, of youth and kind of what um, the implications are on their their lives uh, with the work that we're trying to do. Um, this is a really important question and something that we have to wrestle with, right? Because it's not okay for me um, from the place of privilege where my job actually relies on me being a safe and affirming person instead of um, repressing. Right, it's not um, okay for me to say that uh, border teachers, border teachers need to risk their jobs and their lives in order to advocate um, for queer youth. Um, I think this question of how will the Florida Teachers Union be able to advocate um, for any staff is a really key one, right? So when we're looking at unions, when we're looking at kind of strength in numbers, organization, things like that, um, I think that that's probably where. The work needs to get done is um, in organizing our efforts and specifically organizing around the declared needs of um, LGBTQ youth and specifically black and brown youth because the um, the rates of harm that are being done against queer folks and specifically queer youth are significantly higher um, for black and brown folks. Um, so that would be like my initial thought, but again, I'm not the most qualified to say. Well, definitely. I mean, I mean, I just wanted to get your your thought about it because it definitely yeah. seems to be creating a certain kind of picture where it's like, totally. hey, you want a place to because you mentioned homelessness, so that would like uh, threatening someone's ability to sustain themselves by supporting LGBT issues if they're working in in education. So, okay, we're going to then move on to um, London. Are, 
London, I think, is going to speak a little bit about how these issues are, are going to affect um, the youth as well as maybe LGBT staff or faculty. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so, <laughs> yes, of course. Um, so my name is London, um, he, him pronouns, and I'm working for Lemoyne College as a therapist and outreach coordinator. Um, I work with IPOC students here, um, as well as the wider student body. And a lot of what I'm going to be speaking about is just coming from my education and experiences. Um, so forgive me that I don't have specific uh, sources to cite, but what I will say um, is that I, what, what this, when I started to read about this, what struck me was, was how much this was going to impact, I think, youth identity development in a general sense, whether they are queer questioning or identifying, or even if they are heterosexual or cisgendered, this is going to impact students across the board, as well as their educators and other educational personnel that work in these schools. Being unable to have informed conversations surrounding gender identity and sexual orientation could hinder a student's identity development, specifically because there are a range of social contexts in which they develop and interact and learn who they are as people. And we know that a lot of that for school-aged children, it's happening within their educational institutions among social groups, interactions with other school personnel and with their teachers um, specifically. We know there are other sources as well. I mean, you've got you know interactions with peers outside of courses and out off campus. Um, we have the experiences that they're having online other information that they're consuming from other environments. And so that means there's a range of sources responsible for educating them around these topics, gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, and so what, what an educational institution has as far as like a unique perspective with the power that they have is to be capable of providing formal and informal learning opportunities around these concepts um, and facilitating an environment that involves enriching them you know in their their education around these concepts um, schools are also considered key players for providing social spaces that allow youth to safely explore negotiate and express different dimensions of their identity so these institutions are solely responsible for the healthy progression of their identity development, if these bills go in, into order, then they are restricting, limiting a lot of the um, possibility, possibilities they'll have to further develop their sexual orientation, their gender identity to better understand these concepts, whether they are queer identifying or not. Because again, this is across the board that they're talking about taking away sort of these conversations. Um, other implications that barring sort of informative and educational dialogue um, has on, on school age students, there's a higher risk for them then to consume inaccurate and possibly harmful information around these topics, um, which can be especially dangerous when we're talking about bullying and hate crimes and how this will impact who they are as they continue to develop throughout their lives. Um, as students will become curious about these topics and search for maybe you know, a trusted adult or some other source to kind of educate themselves around the topics on, um, they'll be limited in who they have access to within the educational institution because of these bills. Um, and so in, in the power that an institution has is the opportunity to educate youth on these kinds of concepts through credible resource sources. They have you know, evidence backed, right? We have research that we can pull off of. We set the standard in those educational institutions for how we define these concepts. So we have that responsibility as educators to, to set that standard. If, we don't have that same control when we're talking about other sources that they could gain the information from, whether it's social media, other peer interactions. And that's not to suggest that it's inherently wrong or bad for them to be learning about these concepts through peer interactions or conversations or through social media, right? But we know that there's a higher risk for the skewed, harmful, or inaccurate information to come from those sources. And so we're trying to recognize sort of that power that we would have as an institution to set the standard, right? To kind of 
um, deconstruct a lot of the, the harmful information that may be out there around these, these concepts that the bill is trying to, to limit conversation around. Um, much of children's social, emotional, and psychological development is going to take place within the school. We know that because they are having a lot of their first experiences with making friends, having romantic partners, and just having specific kinds of social interactions when they're in school. So again, the institution is responsible for creating a social space that is safe in which they can explore and discuss their identities and engage in that development. If we have punitive limitations around what can be discussed in the schools when it comes to these, these concepts, then we are communicating to students that you know, they have to remain secretive and sort of um, shameful about these, these questions that they may have, that it's inherently inappropriate or unacceptable to be discussing these concepts. And we already know that this disproportionately impacts queer questioning or identifying youth because in our wider society, the, the structures are created for those who are cisgendered and heterosexual, right? We know that there are hate crimes. We know that there is oppression happening. Um, and so that would further compound those issues that the students are already experiencing and seeing outside of school now that they're you know, in their educational institutions, seeing these, these conversations be limited or being shamed for questioning or bringing it up, having curiosities. Um, you can imagine how this would impact a child's self-esteem their sense of self, um, their ability to connect with other peers and be comfortable fully being who they are. Um, and all of the statistics we were just hearing from Luca, right? Um, higher suicidality, um, higher kind of risk for emotional and mental distress to occur. That absolutely is going to carry on for years and years. I'm seeing students now who are first years um, where this is the first space that they were able to be even just a little bit more themselves, where they were able to speak freely about certain topics they had questions or concerns on, or to be able to interact with peers that they originally were not able to be, maybe because of family dynamics or maybe because of the environment you know, that they um, grew up in. Um, so you can see how this has a very lasting impact for development, for emotional and mental well being. Um, and how it impacts the student's development at large. Um, I think too that when we're talking about, you know, how how will this impact not only right students, but when we're talking about the educational personnel, when we're talking about families that interact with these institutions, we have to really ask, you know, if if this the language in this bill essentially uh, suggests that again it is inappropriate or unacceptable to be discussing these topics. And so that can create sort of this taboo like narrative around um, being able to express their people's identities fully and in, in, in a rich way, right? And being able to um, have conversations around these kinds of topics. And so again, we already know that this is disproportionately impacting those who are queer identifying and that includes staff, that includes educators that want to be able to be in their workspaces fully themselves, right? something as simple as, as having a picture of their family, if they're in a same-sex couple, having a picture of their family on their desk, is this now inappropriate? Is this now going to cause an issue if a student were to ask a question or want to know more? Um, so we can see how this directly impacts though within the schools um, and it, it further kind of creates this aversion toward dialogue around queer persons, making you know, those who work within the schools, those who interact with um, the school, whether they're third parties or families, right, feel as though, okay, is it safe for me to be showing up at school functions here, being to be participating in the environment that is responsible for my child's education? Because right now, you know, it, it feels as though it's not safe to do so because this bill goes is going into into action. So we can see how this has an impact for a range of individuals, both within the school and those who are interacting with them. Okay, I think next we're going to have Maddie speak. Maddie, are you ready to talk to us? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Maddie Sirio, I use she, her pronouns. I am a social worker at Upstate's Inclusive Health Services, um, where our LGBT primary and specialty care program here in Syracuse is housed. Um, and I've been working in LGBTQ health for the last eight years, first floor being specifically with youth and now across the lifespan. Um, um, and so needless to say, I think I agree with everybody. And so far that the Don't Think Bills were obviously devastating to hear about, specifically in Florida, kind of leading the way. Um, but being that I'm coming from a medical uh, setting, 
my second thought was how is this going to impact the health and well-being of queer youth growing up, as well as the faculty and staff. Um, as we know, I think Luca and London highlighted it really well that there are obvious mental health impacts, as well as um, you know some of the statistics that Luca had shared were perfect examples of social implications of these laws that are going to be affecting students and faculty. Um, but for me, I'm trying to circle back on how this all creates back to health, and I think Luca had mentioned minority stress previously, so I'm going to just dive a little bit into that and how that's going to affect uh, folks through these laws. Um, if you aren't familiar with minority stress, um, at its core, it just proposes, specifically when we're talking about queer youth, it proposes that sexual minority health disparities can be explained in large part by stressors induced by hostile homophobic culture which then often results in a lifetime of harassment, maltreatment, discrimination, and victimization. So I just wanna read that first part again, proposes that sexual minority health disparities can be explained large in part by stressors induced in a hostile homophobic culture, which then leads to these outcomes of harassment, maltreatment, discrimination, and all of those external things that are working around us then become internalized. And so a lot of queer folks have had these messages and been treated poorly, but it becomes on this reel in our brains that I am not good enough, I am not worthy enough, something about me is not good, something about me is wrong. And all this leads to these negative physical and mental health outcomes. So that includes PTSD, anxiety, depression, but it also talks about putting people at higher risk for um, substance use disorders, HIV, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and a shorter life expectancy overall for queer folks. So these laws, are essentially exacerbating these med uh, medical and physical health outcomes by ensuring a culture of homophobia and transphobia within school settings. We are saying it very clearly that these are the values and this is how our schools function. And so we are ensuring that culture of homophobia and transphobia, therefore reinforcing a notion that there is something inherently wrong with being LGBTQ. And then that being that there is something inherently wrong with me and I think that that's important to remember that we are internalizing all these messages. Youth are internalizing all these messages they are receiving, but so are staff. And staff are hearing, you know, there's not, there's a part of me that is not good enough to be shared within the school system when my colleagues are able to do that. Um, one of the recent articles I was reading about the Florida bill specifically talked a lot about teachers really struggling with where to draw the line. So if, you know, you have a teacher talking in first grade with families, uh, about families and what family structures look like and you have a child that talks about their two mommies or their two daddies or whatever their family structure may look like, how do you draw a line in that conversation? When does it become breaking the law? Um, when does it become, I've taken it a step too far and put, your risk itself of, or put yourself at risk of being sued, fired, all of these things. And then also on the other hand, how do I handle that? How do I mitigate this this moment where a student is trying to confide in me or talk about something that is important to them, whether it's their identity, their family structure, you know, do we say to students, we, can we can't discuss this by law, I'm not able to have this conversation or we can't go any further with this. Thus just increasing that internalized message of there's something wrong with you and we can't talk about it because you are different. So it's putting educators in a really uncomfortable position and the laws themselves, which it should be noted, are, are written intentionally vague. So they say that um, no instruction around sexual orientation and gender identity can be happening in the classroom, but provide no context or definition of what instruction looks like. And then in certain parts of the law, that says no discussion around sexual orientation and gender identity. So what is discussion? What is instruction? Can students talk about it amongst themselves in the classroom? Do we need to step in and shut that down? Can we talk about it? You know, can students share their perspectives about their families and their lives? How do I shut that down? And it's just creating this kind of ongoing cycle of chaos within a classroom at this point. Um, I think it also gives a green light for discrimination within medical care systems and other systems at large, because if no one is taking care of you in one system, like education system, we move over to medical, who's gonna hold anyone responsible there? Um, beyond don't say gay bills, I think Kelly brought up earlier, the overturn of Roe has had significant implications for us as a society. Um, I think it's important just to acknowledge here that it also has significant implications for LGBTQ folks. We know people of all genders require access to abortion care 
But beyond that, most facilities that are providing affirming and safe abortions are also places that are providing affirming and safe LGBTQ care, as well as hormone, access to hormones and things like that. So by reducing access to those things, we are also taking away. Um, the final piece I want to touch on before I finish up is just within the minority stress model, there is this uh, conversation around resilience and building resilience. So this ability to overcome those external messages that have become internal messages. And those are built, I think Luca and London both talked about it, about you know, having supportive adults in your life, supportive communities, supportive families, supportive friends, and um, being able to shut out some of that noise. Um, I struggle with this a little bit because I think that oftentimes, um, you know, resilience is the ability to successfully adapt and succeed despite adversary, adversity and is um, generally seen as a positive, but I think that we glorify it in a way that keeps us in the status quo of saying, oh, you can overcome, other people have overcome. We hear these glorified stories of people getting through discrimination, but we don't hear about the actual things that they have gone through or what is being done to change that. And I think that's what we have you all here today to talk about is really how do we change that? How do we move away from the status quo of like resilience being positive to people shouldn't have to be resilient. They should be awarded these rights and safe spaces as a human being. Um, so in closing for me, you know, we cannot allow bills like these and the overturning of Roe to become that status quo. And we cannot continue to listen to the stories of queer youth who felt so alone that they didn't think that they were going to make it to 30 to be sitting in a panel like this. And it's not a positive when we are building a world where resilience is a norm and the laws and bills like these aren't. Thank you so much, Maddie. Thank you for your, for your contribution. And so um, we are done with the now, but our next step is we're going to have Mr. Sean Massey is going to talk with us a little bit and offer some suggestions how we might be able to push back against this. I know it just seems like all this doom and gloom, but we're still fighting and we're not done fighting yet. So Sean Massey, please take it away. All right, so hi everybody. Um, my name is Sean Massey, he, him pronouns. I'm faculty in the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program at Binghamton University. And I wanna quickly repeat something I posted in the chat. Many of the bills being proposed are actually combinations of don't say gay LGBTQ bills, bills and bills prohibiting any discussion of the history of racial injustice in our country. And I think, you know, if you go back and review that list of states and go in and dive a little deeper into what they're actually proposing, you know, it's it's an omnibus just you know, a uh, hate bill. You know, so it's like they're 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 throwing things in, and I wouldn't be surprised if in some places they add language prohibiting any discussion of reproductive justice. So just you know, there there's a kind of war on justice that's happening, and um and those those states are you know, some of the starting places, but I expect it to expand. So, so my, my assignment was to guide a conversation about what's next, what can we do? And as we've heard from the panel, the harm is real and profound that these bills are gonna do. So how do we confront our current situation in a way that can lead to real change? Now, I'll just say that the background I chose for my slide, uh, slides is the Texas State Capitol building. It's from a protest event I was part of back in 2002 when, the state, rep when state Representative Talton attempted to ban LGBTQ people from fostering or adopting children. And he was going to make it retroactive so that the, the Texas Rangers were going to go in and take, take kids away from forever families. Luckily, we you know, we organized and were able to kind of keep this bill from moving forward. But I think part of what's important sort of message here is that um, uh, the threats we're facing today, are, you know, as you know, as all of you know, who are on this call, you know, are not entirely new. In fact, they're sort of familiar. And um, so certainly starting with things like teach-ins, like this event, um, it, it's important. And following that, there needs to be action. But as I'm guessing most of us know, the people on this call, before you take action, it's critical to think about strategy. What's gonna be effective? What's gonna work? 
So today I thought we'd talk a bit about strategy. Now, I don't, we can't really get into it deeply given the amount of time we have. And, and given the crowd who signed on today, the concepts of things like strategizing or power mapping are maybe familiar to you. If they are, you may also know that they take much more time than the 10 minutes I've been allocated. So I thought we'd start with some basic questions that are key to power mapping. These are selected from a terrific resource I got from AFT that can be used to start a fairly comprehensive uh, power mapping strategy mapping session. And if you're interested in having access to these resources for your local chapters, please feel free to reach out after the workshop and we'll make sure you get a copy. Okay, so um, what do we wanna make happen? You know, we've, we, we know what's happening out there in the world. We know the harm it's done. So, you know, what is our goal? What do we wanna make happen um, in response, you know, and, and I think that we can probably all agree that, you know, stopping any bills from being passed that haven't been passed yet is, is one, one thing we need to do. Another, of course, is to try to get the bills that are there on the books that have been passed repealed, right, to, to pull them back. We want to try to, that's primary prevention, right? We, we can stop the harm. The other, of course, as people have talked about, is there has to be secondary prevention, you know, things that can actually limit the harm that's been done and that is being done. So these are two different approaches that we can have. So part of power mapping is to decide who are the decision makers, you know, who, who, who is pushing this stuff forward, who, who makes a decision, who can keep it from happening, who has the power to keep it from happening, right? Who has influence on those people? Who are our allies? Who are the opponents and who's undecided? Who can we influence? These are things that power mapping you know, requires us to think about. Um, once we lay all of that out, then we have to think about what are strategies that we can use to build relationships among, you know, with, with, our, with the allies, with the undecided, with the people we can influence to work towards our goals, both individuals, groups, and organizations that are working towards our goals. Um, what can we do in our, in our relationship with these people to, 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 to stop our opponents, to keep them from pushing bills forward, from, from uh, furthering and expanding the, these, um, these efforts to harm, you know, harm us and our communities? And how can we get more people on our side to convince them to stand with us and fight against you know, the, these, these horrible bills? Now, another thing, and this is something that, that my colleagues reminded me of when we talked about planning this, is what's already being done locally, you know, in those states? What, what, what are people doing in the states that, that have either don't say gay bills on, on the books or pending legislation? What do they need from us? And, and who do we need to reach out to? So we need to put that list together too, to make sure that we know we're not, we're not starting something that is gonna be, you know, a counterproductive to the local work that's being done uh, or, or redundant or whatever. So we need to do that work as well. So some possible actions. These are things that, that have, have happened in the past, some things that we've thought about. Um, you know, one thing that could happen is local chapters could pass resolutions encouraging, encouraging the UP executive board to pass resolution instructing the UP president, Fred Cole, to write letters to the New York state governor and the SUNY chancellor to, uh, uh, to prohibit business travel of states that have passed don't say gay laws um, or the anti-critical race theory or anti-abortion legislation um, who have passed any of that. Um, we have, that's happened in the past. There have been efforts to, you know, there has in the past, you know, travel to conferences, to, you know, spending money in states that, that, that have these regressive laws on the books. You know, that has happened in the past. Another would be to, to uh, reach out to the major publishing companies to ask for their commitment not to um, uh, do what the state boards of education in these hate states might ask them to do to censor their textbooks, you know, in terms of removing things like references to LGBTQ lives, uh, uh, marriage equality, uh, discussions of, of gender identity expression, um, and potentially boycott those textbook publishers that that actually do um, remove that that 
that, the, those references. McGraw-Hill in the past actually removed any reference to same-sex marriage from their health textbooks for junior high and high school um, health textbooks because the Texas State Board of Education told them to. And, and so, you know, we want to we want to call on publishers to basically say, you know, don't don't do this, don't contribute, don't participate in this injustice. And then also, of course, reach out to our union partners and ask them to issue clear statements of condemnation if they haven't already. So those are some ideas. But what are some other ideas that, that people have? And I'm going to um, toggle to my other screen because I don't actually I can't see the chat. What other ideas do people have in terms of what we can do? Any thoughts? Feel free to post it in the chat or raise your hand. Well, do people have any reaction to the ideas of perhaps a yes. travel ban or a boycott or reaching out to the publishers? What other kind, any, any thoughts on that? Um, let's see. California faculty cannot travel to a number of states. Do you know how effective this has been? Um, well, that, that is a question. And New York had it as well for um, a number of years ago, right? So one of the things to do is to do the research about how effective those kinds of bans have been. One of the things that they do is ex expand the, you know, the, 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 the awareness of this across you know, our colleagues and, and also let, let the states know that there's an economic threat that's gonna happen you know, if they continue along this line of, of passing these regressive bills. So there is a comment in the chat, travel bans are powerful. However, I wonder uh, how we approach that when half the states are upholding so many hate and discrimination based bills, that is definitely something that I had made a comment uh, at previous meetings that should something like this ever happen, that could be a very long list of places one can't travel to. Yeah, um, absolutely. Now it may be that, that you could limit it to those states where the bans have been passed you know, not the places that are considering it. So that, that's one way to kind of reduce the list a little bit. Um, I, I, there was another idea about um, uh, administrations need to protect faculty and academic freedom. Okay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, New York State, of course, is, you know, not one of these states. states. So, so that makes it a little, um, you know, it's, it's I, I think, a little bit safer for us, not entirely, but a little bit safer for us. Um, Sean, Kerry in the yeah. chat wanted to know, how do we find out about the publishing companies that are compliant with censorship? Right. Well, the, so, so again, a lot of this work has to be done after this, conver you know, after this workshop, you know, to, to see these are ideas that we can pursue. Um, one of the things that, that we were thinking about is simply getting them to take a position publicly in response to this legislation to say, we will not you know, censor our, our textbooks, our materials, our resources. Um, those who have already done it, or, or who, who go ahead and do it, then that option. Um, Henry in. wanted to know about, well, not, was suggested that we research supportive candidates and provide them with financial support for their campaigns. So once again, putting our, you know, our, our mouth, our, where whatever the saying is mm -hmm. money where the mouth is or something like that you guys know what i meant right <laughs> yeah and, and make that make that um you know make that list available to all of our our members absolutely you know like like here are the people who are fighting against this actively here are the people who are who are standing up to this um is it, um, Anne wants to know, is it more powerful to withhold our dollars or can we have a greater impact by going through and supporting the good local efforts? So that's kind of piggybacking off of what was stated before. So, right. and um, what about um, renewing the ERA amendment, rectifying it? What do we think about that? ERA now, 2022, what do we think about ERA 2022? 
Long game. <laughs> Very long, long game. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have um, Jen says many professional societies are having DSISJ committees rather than travel bans. It would be great if our professional societies did not plan meetings in the states having these bills. Um, I am not familiar with DSISJ. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Jen? Yeah, it's Jan. Jan. Um, Jan, I apologize. Yeah. No, Jan. that's fine. The, if the, I looked the, at the photo, I would have figured that out. The, Sorry. the spelling seems the same. Um, uh, basically, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice level committees. Uh, a lot of the professional societies I belong to as a biologist have such committees that are part of their structure. Um, and in the as those societies go forward in planning where they're going to be having their national meetings, I think it would be really fantastic if there was enough representation from all of the different individuals within that society to push and make sure that those societies don't even plan the meetings in these states, or if they already have them planned and on the books, if there's some way that they can cancel that and move it to a different place. Um, I think having the larger group has a bigger impact than necessarily some individual bands might have. If large organizations just pick up and say, nope, we're not going there. We're gonna take our meeting somewhere else. I, if I could make one comment about that, just uh, one of my professional organizations, SPSP, um, it basically their, their, their next convention is in um, Atlanta. And um, they have, uh, they have been concerned about, um, uh, they've gotten a lot of pushback from, um, you know, changing the venue for their conference. And of course, they're like, I don't know what to do because we plan this two years in advance, <laughs> you know, and there's like, you know, lots of financial costs to, to canceling it right away. So that's something we're going to have to navigate if we push for this, right? Is that there, there is a kind of, there is a serious cost to these organizations to do that, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't. It's just, it's part of, you know, what we have to contend with when we advocate. Um, there is a comment um, from, uh, Margaret uh, Lauber, I agree with travel bans and boycotts, but SUNY isn't perfect on these matters either, and New York say, uh, State isn't safe. So that is, it's hard to disagree with that statement, um, so I won't, but the point really is here too. Anyway, I, I, I attended the Labor Notes Conference a couple weeks ago. I um, and I attended a, a session on a censorship in which uh, a Florida elementary school teacher was a part of it. A New Jersey uh, school psycholo psychologist was a part of it. And I asked this, uh, the question basically, what can we start planning to do in a state that doesn't necessarily have that issue pending, but what can we do? And the answer that they gave me was less focus on tactic and more about engaging and building capacity. So once you get to whatever tactic may be appropriate in that moment, you have the ability to do so. You have built the capacity. So I think a lot of the things that we're going to be doing will be less uh, tactic specific and really about engaging our membership to be aware and fully um, uh, um, uh, in support of uh, our community and the other uh, communities that are being impacted by varying uh, um, draconian laws and, uh, and attempts to rewind the clock. So now to that end, I would like to just mention it's 107 and we had said we were going to have a, an hour long session. Uh, I want to um, promise everyone here that this is not the end discussion here. We barely have gotten started within this one hour. So I'm hopeful that you will be uh, paying attention to communications coming out about future uh, um, efforts that we as the Soul Committee would like to uh, investigate. I would like to welcome 
uh, any UUP member to come to the Soul Committee um, meetings. We meet on the second Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m., uh, even during summer, and they have all been virtual because we have members across the state. And I uh, want to also encourage uh, uh, your involvement in those other committees that I had mentioned at the beginning of the, the panel discussion. So to that end, I would like to just thank everyone's here, uh, everyone here who has uh, attended and contributed and also um, uh, thank you for your future involvement because that is where we um, need to be fully uh, together um, so that we don't um, succumb separately. So, all uh, right. Uh, lastly, Abby Perkins had a great last statement. She said, we may be safe in New York for now, but we yeah. have to remain active to keep it that way. So that was the point of this. We need to, we, we can't be comfortable anymore. We can't Never. just assume that because we're in New York, we're fine. Mm -hmm. This thing is kind of spreading. And I remember when they first started talking about the don't say gay bills, we were talking about Alabama and Florida. And when Kelly showed his presentation, there were like at least seven states and they're growing, aren't they? They're growing every day. Mm -hmm. So we have to be vigilant. The last day of pride, be as proudful as we can. Continue to be great allies. If you're an ally, a member of the community, support other members of the community. And, you know, we're going to keep fighting, right? Yes. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Um, and again, uh, keep an eye out for further communications. And everyone have a safe and uh, lovely day.